Hey everybody, this is AP Macro Review Major Graphs. We are doing loanable funds market in this video. Guys, yeah, talk about the term loanable funds. Don't get tripped up by loanable funds. We're just talking about loans, guys. Yeah, we've got the suppliers of loans and the demanders of loans, okay? We're talking about where borrowing and lending happens, okay? That's what this market is all about. If you need financial capital, you go here. If you have excess financial capital you're willing to part with for a while, this is where you go. That's what this market is all about. So, let's get to the labeling of our axes. First of all, it's the loanable funds market. Guys, if it was the t-shirt market, what would I put here? The price of t-shirt. Loanable funds market, what am I gonna put here? The price of loanable funds. And what is the price of loanable funds? It's the real interest rate. Guys, here's the thing. Economists, when they start talking about what's happening to interest rates, they have two tools to go to. They go to the money market, or they go to this graph, the loanable funds market. Again, let me say that, it's really important how economists think about this. When we start saying what's happening to interest rates in an economy, we have two graphs that we go to, two tools, okay? We either go to the money market or the loanable funds market, okay? These are our tools for finding out what's happening to the interest rate. When it comes to the money market, what goes on the vertical axis? It's the nominal interest rate because the cost of holding your wealth in liquid form is the nominal interest rate. You are foregoing both the real interest rate and you're foregoing the inflation premium. Basically, it's like this, guys. When you hold your wealth as money, we very much care about the amount of money you are foregoing, which is the nominal interest rate. However, when it comes to borrowing and lending, borrowers and lenders are actually making their decisions based on the real interest rate. Here's the thing, guys. When someone lends money, they're actually not so concerned about the percentage increase in dollars they're going to get. I know that sounds strange, but you think, yes, they are. They're actually far more concerned with what's the percentage increase in goods and services I'm going to be able to buy by parting with my, uh, some of my wealth for a while. And that is the real interest rate. That's the percentage increase in goods and services the lender is expecting to be able to buy. Say with borrower, they're not so concerned with the percentage increase in dollars they're gonna have to pay. I know that sounds strange. However, what a borrower is ultimately concerned about, guys, is how much they're gonna have to work to pay this off, right? That's what they care about, and that is something the real interest rate tells them. Put it this way, guys. If over the course of the loan, the real interest rate ends up being higher than we expected it to be, that means you're gonna have to work more to pay it off. If the real interest rate ends up being lower than we expected it to be, you're gonna to get to work less, and that's what the borrower ultimately cares about. So again, the decision to borrow and lend that is based upon the real interest rate. Now, over here, straightforward, if it said t-shirts, we'd have quantity of t-shirts. It says loanable funds, we've got quantity of loanable funds. Next, we've got the supply of loanable funds and the demand for loanable funds. Now, there's a little bit of different ways teachers handle uh, the different macro aggregate actors and how we represent them in this graph. So not all teachers are the same in the way they handle how these macro aggregate actors, what are those? That's households, businesses, government, the rest of the world, and the Fed, how they interact with this graph. But however any teacher or any textbook does handle it, they're going to all get the same answer when it comes to the real interest rate, okay? I'm going to try to make that clear as I go on. Let's start talk about what all teachers and all textbooks agree with first, though. Our two, two of our big macro aggregate actors that we're going to put on the board first are households and businesses. Households, everybody agrees with, those are suppliers of loanable funds. Remember, households are net savers. On the aggregate, when we look at all households in an economy, rich, poor, middle class, they are net savers. I know a lot of households borrow, but on average, guys, they are net savers. They are supplying loanable funds, and every teacher, every textbook handles households as suppliers of loanable funds. And so, here's how it works. It's very straightforward, but it's a question that is often put out there and we need to be able to handle. Let's just say we get a question that says, households increase their savings. Households increase their savings. And that is an increase, okay, in the supply of loanable funds. Well, what's going to happen to the real interest rate? Because that's what the problem's going to care about, okay? They're not going to care. That's right, guys. Most of the time, there's not going to be problems. There's not going to be any questions about what's happening on this axis. They're going to care very much what's happening at the real interest rate. So supply of loanable funds shifts to the right, what's happening at the real interest rate, it is going down. Now, if household savings decreases, straightforward, right? That's a decrease in the, so let's put increase right there, decrease in savings, that is a decrease in the supply of loanable funds. 
Again, no disagreement on how economists handle that. Next, businesses. Every economist agrees they are demanders of global funds. Every textbook, every economist, all teachers, businesses are demanders of global funds, okay? Now, if business confidence increases, if all of a sudden the expected real rate of return to business projects increases because businesses feel more confident about the economy, demand for global funds is going to increase, and guys, what's going to happen to the interest rate? It's going to go up. So I'm going to put this right word arrow, increase in business confidence, BC for business confidence. If business confidence decreases, okay, all of a sudden businesses adjust their expected real rate of return downward, we're going to go ahead and shift this curve to the left. That's a decrease in business confidence. What's going to happen to the interest rate, the real interest rate? It's going to go down. Now, the next one, guys, is the most, like, uh, there's the most difference among teachers and how they handle it, and that is the government, okay? Let me talk about one school of thought that I'm not, that this is not the way I do it. One school of thought is when we do government, we should see them as either augmenting or siphoning away household savings. Let me put it this way, guys. Typical question is this. Government deficit increases. What do we mean government deficits increase? We're saying that we've got a certain amount of taxes, a certain amount of outflows, and those outflows increase in respect to the taxes, right? The deficit is bigger. The government needs more money. So they go here to get money, and one way to handle that is to say they are going to siphon household savings away from businesses, okay? They're going to siphon that household savings away from businesses. So what they will do is they will shift that supply of vulnerable funds to the left. That's an increase in the deficit. Shift the supply of vulnerable funds to the left because it's siphoning savings away from businesses. And you'll see the interest rate go up. Lots of textbooks, lots of economists handle it that way. But a lot of textbooks and economists also handle it the way that I do, which is, hey, when governments have deficits, they borrow money. They are demanding loanable funds. So we're going to show them as demanders of loanable funds. So I'm going to put government down here. The way I teach it is there are two demanders of loanable funds. There are businesses and governments, and they are competing for funds. Okay, They're competing with each other for funds. If that government deficit increases, guys, they're going to demand more loanable funds. They need more money to fill that deficit. Shift the demand to the right. What's going to happen to real interest rate? It's going to go up. Again, the thing that's going to be asked about when it comes to government deficits increasing and decreasing is what's happening to the real interest rate or the interest rate in general. And we all get the same answer. So, for me, government is a demander of loanable funds. They have deficits. They're demanding loanable funds. I'm going to show them that way. So here's the deal. If the deficit increases, so the deficit increases, we're going to shift that demand to the right. They need more money. If that deficit decreases, okay, so we get a decrease in the deficit, all right, we're going to shift the demand for loanable funds to the left, and we will get the right answer when it comes to the real interest rate. Next, let's do the, real, the rest of the world, okay? So that's our next macro aggregate act we talk about. The rest of the world, I do see them as either augmenting or siphoning away household savings. So how does this work? If we get a capital inflow, okay, so that's money from the rest of the world coming into our financial markets, that is augmenting, that's adding to household savings. So I just simply shift this to the right. This is a capital inflow. The real interest rate goes down, right? Supply of mobile funds is right, real interest rate goes down. And guys, let's just get to the real world for a second. This shouldn't um, be surprising to us, right? If the rest of the world all of a sudden wants to put more money in the U.S. financial market, so money starts coming into our financial market, what's going to happen to the price of loanable funds? They're going to go down. That should comport with our just common sense, okay? That should be like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, how about if all of a sudden investments abroad look really good, and so we have a capital outflow, so money's flowing out of our economy. Basically, household savings is not going to businesses, domestic businesses, or the domestic government, it starts to flow out, okay? If we get an outflow, then what's gonna to happen to the supply of vulnerable funds for domestic businesses and our domestic government? That supply is gonna to shift to the left and the interest rate is gonna go uh, up, and that should also make sense, right? What I'm talking about is this market right here, we can think of it as like the U.S. vulnerable funds market, okay? Or any other countries, but for right now, let's just talk about it as like the U.S. vulnerable funds market. Capital outflow out of the United States, that's financial capital heading out of the United States, What's going to happen to the price of loanable funds? It's going to go up. So shift that supply of loanable funds to the left. That's our capital outflow. And we get exactly what we would expect to get. 
shift that to the left, you'll see that real edge tray go up. Now, the final thing I do is a bit um, unconventional. I do not mind showing the Fed impacting this market. I want you to know the, the number one graph to go to among economists when it comes to Federal Reserve action or the actions of central banks of a country is the money market. So we get a central bank question, we get a Fed question. The, the, the market that we normally go to is the money market. But I don't really have a problem showing the Fed impacting this market. Now, some people don't like it because they don't want to show the Fed actually directly changing the real interest rate. Okay? I don't mind it. So I'm going to put the Fed right here. Let's I'm put a little asterisk. Okay? But here's the idea, guys. What is the Fed mainly doing? It's either doing easy or tight monetary policy. If they're doing easy to, uh, monetary policy, what are they doing? They're putting reserves into banks. And what are reserves? Those are funds that can be loaned, right? So they want to do easy monetary policy. They want to get more lending, more borrowing out there, okay? They're going to put reserves into banks to get the interest rate to go down. What are reserves? Again, those are loanable funds. I don't mind showing that as shifting the supply of loanable funds to the right. So this is easy monetary policy. Now, tight monetary policy, what are they going to do? They're going to pull reserves out of the banking system. So tight monetary policy, they're going to go to the banking system, pull reserves out so that banks have less loanable funds. If banks have less loanable funds, we're going to shift it this direction. This is tight monetary policy, and we will be able to say what's happening to the real interest rate. Now, a more conventional way to talk about the Fed and the real interest rate is they affect it indirectly. They'll say this, that hey, when the Fed increases the money supply, that does get some more loan, we get more investment, we get AB shifting to the right, we get an increase in real GDP, which increases national income, which increases household savings. Household savings increases because of this monetary policy, shift the, uh, the, the supply of mobile funds to the right, interest rate goes down, real interest rate goes down because of these monetary policy. For me, I just I think that's a little bit more than we really need to think about, guys. It, I think just common sense says, what is the Fed doing? They're either pulling reserves out or putting reserves into the banking system. And again, I don't mind showing that impact more directly on the real interest rate. Just understand some economists don't love it and also understand that when you're asked a question about the Fed, the general graph that we're going to go to is that other graph about interest rates, which is the money market. But this will help you out. It will never steer you wrong as far as what's happening to the real interest rate, the impact the Fed's having on the real interest rate. So again, five macro aggregate actors. That's all we've got, guys. We've got households, businesses, government, the rest of the world, and the Fed. I like to put them just like this. I've got all five. Any question we ever get about what the, one of those macro aggregate actors is doing, we can get the right answer when it comes to the real interest rate. Hope that made sense to you. We'll see you in another uh, video. <laughs>